What's up, gang? Welcome to The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius from Shazda. I'm so pumped to have you here with me. Now listen, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. Number one, people who are living their passions. And number two, those who are creating greatness in the world and doing both of these things despite the odds against them. Each episode, we're going to feature interviews with game changers, business leaders, you know, telling us their origin stories, what made them tick, what got them to where they are now. Why? So it can help you step into your greatness within your life, your business, and your career. Occasionally, you might hear a few solo episodes from myself, moi, as I say, as I leverage my 20 years of entrepreneurship as a CEO and founder to help you grow and level up in your journey to scale your life and your business. So come be a fly on the wall, enjoy the conversation, and I'm stoked to have you here with me. Guys, welcome to today's episode of The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius Mershazade, and boy, do we have a special guest. Stacy Spikes is in the house. What's up, brother? How are you, man? Excited to uh, be here with you. Man, if, if the audience could only have listened to the last nine minutes and 41 seconds before we started the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, you know what? If you guys are lucky, maybe I'll have the team edit, edit it in at the end so you can hear all the fun shit we talked about. So, um, and my wife, you, my wife... Uh, you can you cannot listen to that. So listen, um, do you mind if I do a little bit of, of housekeeping, dude, and then we'll get p- jumping into the show? Does that work? Absolutely. So uh, greatness machine for listeners who are new to the show, the greatness machine. We're about two things: people are living their passions, and those are creating greatness in the world and doing so despite the odds. And my man Stacy here is neither short of passion nor greatness. So um, I want to give a little bit of background here. First and foremost, you guys know that it's pretty common. I always have a backstory on how I know somebody. I, I usually know a lot of our guests, either a friend of a friend or there's someone I know directly. Um, or it's someone that I was out there just like, you know, stalking until I got him to come on the show. It's, it's one of four. That's three. The fourth is that, you know, there's all these PR companies out there that are out there just kind of pounding on podcast doors, especially like podcasts like ours, top ranked podcasts. We get a lot of requests. I get probably, I don't know, five a day. Um, and and ninety nine point nine nine percent of those, are, it's, it's like, meet meet Jimmy. Jimmy's the top realtor, and I'm like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, it's like like I mean, I'm sure Jimmy's a cool guy to him and his buddies, but like, the, you don't want to listen to that, listeners. I mean, unless you're a realtor. And so, uh, Stacy's people reached out, and I was like, dude, this guy seems pretty interesting. So I went and did some <laughs> research on him, and I was like, bam, I want to ask him to come on the show. So, man, here we are making it happen coming here to promote yes. the new book, all the cool shit you're doing. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, buddy. So it, it really is an honor. I'm serious. When they told me about your show and you said yes, I was like, yes. So thank you. Oh, man. Pleasure's mine. So I'm going to do your formal bio, if you don't mind, and then we'll, we'll get jumping into uh, the, the infamous origin story that everyone gets to tell. Is that cool? Sure. Absolutely. Awesome. So you guys, Stacy is the author, and I'm going to show the book for video people that see this. He's the author of Black Founder, The Hidden Power of Being an Outsider, co-founder of MoviePass, which I thought was super cool. My brother-in-law was a huge MoviePass guy, and founder of the Urban World Film Festival. And we're going to be talking all about his new book, as well as MoviePass, which some of you all might be like, I remember that company. And you're going to be stoked to hear about what's going on with it, because this is a really, really dynamic and interesting entrepreneurial story. Uh, that I can't wait to hear Stacy tell. So before we go there, though, Stacy, if you don't mind, I'd love it if you could maybe give us a little bit of your origin story, man. Could kind of tell us where did you come from and how did you get to where you got to? Sure. So uh, thanks for having me on. And um, so I'm originally from Houston, Texas, and uh, growing up in the astronaut city, you know, I wanted to either be a fighter pilot or an actor. And God knows, you know, how those two are connected. And um, the very first time I'll never forget. So I think the first movie that knocked my socks off was Star Wars, right? I'd never seen anything like that. It was just mind blowing. But the movie that made me want to be in the business, I said, whatever that is, I want to do that was Blade Runner. Hmm. And um, I remember there was probably four people in the theater. Um, My dad took me, I was still a teenager and my dad fell asleep. My brother was like, can't we leave this theater? And I was mesmerized, the flying cars, everything. And I was like, I have to, I have to be in that business. And um, the minute I graduated from high school, I went to Los Angeles, um, kind of bopped around doing the audition thing, back in jobs. And in a weird way, I ended up getting a job uh, at Motown. Barry Gordy had sold Motown to Universal. And, you know, 
back then it was like, all right, that's my dad's music. That's my, you know, that's not, that doesn't have anything to do with me. And, um, but they were hiring and somebody, a friend of a friend said, you should go interview. And I get this job and I become a product manager and a product manager is like a marketing person. And out of the blue, I end up being on boys to men's album. And, uh, which one, which one was it? Was the it the one? one. The Wait, first it, one, Cooley High Harmony. Oh man. Should and, we do a, should we do some acapella? Of, no. Uh, it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. That's, that's, and that's I'll the... take with me the memories to be my sunshine after the rain. Oh my goodness. You, you are brave to try and follow boys to men. Brave or crazy? I was like, one, I'm light brown, but I was going to say I was one of those white boys. Me and my boys would like sing that song in our car. I, I graduated high school in 96. That was a really popular song. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Dude, that's a first for the show is me singing on the show. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. If you were to happen to Google my name and yes. type in best man speech, you may oh, or may no. not see a video of me singing oh, a song no. by Peter Cetera at my brother's wedding with a 10-person acapella band behind me. Maybe. Oh, my. maybe. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. Sorry, That's sorry, crazy. dude. So you're working on yeah. Boys to Men. That thing goes through the roof. Uh, we were projecting to do 500,000 on the first album. We did 8 million. Uh, we went on to break Elvis Presley's record for uh, weeks at number one with the song End of the Road that's played at every wedding on earth now. And, um, and I was doing a lot of soundtracks. Then I went to Sony. I did the Bad Boys soundtrack. Um, and then I went to Miramax. I was there for a bit, uh, working with the illustrious, insane Weinstein brothers. How'd that, and how'd that go? How was, how was that experience? It, it, it was back in the day. It was just an insane place to work. It was, I, I had been in the industry all my life and that was crazy. That was Did you, did nuts. you know that he was, that he was like, did you have like female workers that were like whispering about him doing shady shit or was that really under wraps? It wasn't. You know, that that kind of happened to so two things. One, it didn't happen in the office, and it tended to happen later as they got more and more powerful. Mm. Um, you know, as the casting couch got more powerful, um, it, it tended to be that. But I was there for a year, and, um, you know, you, you, you heard rumors, but you never saw anything. Um, so you just never – we were just too busy being yelled at for being – incompetent employees who couldn't couldn't do anything right you know that's all that's all i knew i, th I think um, we, we, we came from the same generation when you could still yell at your employees and it was yeah. totally like it was not even that it was like kind of acceptable it was like fucking normal you know yeah when now, if you ever now, saw now. if you ever saw the movie swimming with sharks with kevin spacey and uh um, no I, I haven't seen that yeah so it's 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 this bad, you know, they were swimming with sharks and then bad boss, bad bosses and a few other films. Again, you dealt with screamers and yellers like today you would, you would be on a uh, YouTube and TikTok in two seconds. You're acting like that. And, you know, but back then that was, that was how everybody rolled. And, um, yeah, go, so go, the good old days. Yeah. And then, so <laughs> went, and started urban world so that's now the largest minority festival in the world uh still going um and then out of urban world we spun off movie pass and then um you and i'll get into the story of that but just saw some product market fits and felt that the movie industry needed a subscription model and now everybody and their mother's trying to copy the original and we're bringing it back what so so man that's such that's such a i mean that First of all, that's a very succinct uh, explanation of what you did, and I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so you were on. I mean, look, going from the, it sounds like you were on the production side or like the what the A and R side. What side of the? What were you, no, when you were I was in, on. I was on the marketing side. So the marketing side. I was me. product manager is the A and R's counterpart. So I I had the marketing budget. So in the movie side, it's the poster, the trailer, the ads, all that. You've got the budget, and you're not PR or social but you're the one paying for everything else. And so that was, that was my role all the way through the music. And uh, so I had the budget for the music video, the budget for the album, the budget for, um, you know, if they wanted to do special vinyl pieces, it would come out of our budgets. So 
Yeah. What, how do you, so, so a lot of folks, I mean, Hollywood especially. So you were in LA at the time doing this, is that correct? Yeah, I was, yeah, I was in LA until I came to Miramax and then that was a New York move. And then and I so, haven't left since. Okay. So you, so you've been in New York then for what, what year was that did you, that you end up in New York? 99. Oh shit. Okay. So Nin, you, no, 90, 90, no, 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 97. 96, oh, wow. 97. All right. Yeah. So, 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 and, and so you were in, and 97 was when you got there for uh, Miramax. So yeah. you were, so you were there, man, you were there for 9 11 then. Um, I, I lived a block away and I was home that morning when 9 11 happened. I, uh, the crazy thing, it's actually in the book. Um, I had a presentation, an investor presentation on like the 95th floor on September 12th. Wow. So, I, you know, I always tell people after that day, my life is the same. You just don't know when you're going to leave home and not come back. And you got to live every day as if it's your last and every conversation with everyone you meet, pretend like that's the last time you're going to see them. Make sure your affairs are in order because one day it will be the last time. Yeah. Yeah. Ho hopefully it's, it's a long time away, but to your point, yeah. like there, there's a lot of, a lot of folks that, you know, like, I mean, I had this happen in my family. Three years ago, my brother-in-law went on vacation. He was 46. He went to, to Tasmania because to, yeah. his cousin moved to Australia and he never came home. Yeah. Like 46. He, he got diagnosed. Yeah. I'm not kidding. With can with cancer during COVID March, mm. like February of 2020 on vacation. And he never came yeah. home. He, three wow. weeks later, he passed away. So that, that, wow. and I was like, dude, this guy seemed like healthy. And I mean, it's yeah. Like, yeah, so I've seen it firsthand and a lot of people have stories like that where you're like, you got to be where your feet are, man. You know, like yep. all you got is today. Um, That's right. So l let me ask you a question. So let's talk a little sure. bit about Urban World because this is something that you did for 14 years. Um, yeah. You were in the film business. How long were you in the film business for at this point when you went from Mir to Miramax and started Urban World? Yeah, so a couple of years and what we noticed was there was just not – you know, you go to the major festivals, not only was there not any diversity in the content creator side of the world, there was no diversity in the executive branches either. And so it was like, look, I, I went to the guys at Sundance and I said, hey, can I help you program more diverse content? Because I came out of hip hop and like, that's just, you're like coming out of a world where you, you, you go to another place. And you're like, wait, where's the rest of the population? And so I just, I felt like it was my responsibility to kind of say to the Sundance people, Hey, can I help you with your diversity? Can I help, you know, get some more people in here? And they're like, well, you know, we see thousands of movies every year and we show the best. And I said, according to who? And that, that really pissed me off. And so when we started Urban World, we world premiered how Stella got her groove back, Water Fools Fall in Love, Original Kings of Comedy, uh, The Best Man. Uh, we premiered Collateral with Tom Cruise. Uh, at one point, we had more top five world premieres than any festival in North America. Wow. And it's like, and yet we're not a household name. Robert Redford or Robert De Niro didn't start the festival. But Ava DuVernay, um, the director, she came out of urban world tim story who directed fantastic four yeah. came out of urban world um um you know rosaria dawson like there's just so many people that it, you you helped give them their start and that that not that they these people wouldn't have made it but it helped shine a light on them that wasn't there yeah, man, you, you were you were just early, you know, like the yeah. DE and I thing, just like you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think this is part of being our age, right? I, I remember yeah. I was in college, and to your point, and this is like 1998, and I took like, a, and I, dude, I loved acting. I was like, yeah. always do these improv classes, and and my parents were like, if you do a dramatic arts major, we were not funding your college, dude. Sorry. Yeah. But, um, so my parents were not very, they were like, you need better be, I'm, I'm half Persian. They were, they, they didn't even know what that yeah. meant. They're like, you out of your mind. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I, I just had to quietly do it behind the scenes. Um, but, um, yeah, so, so accounting major, but anyway, I'm, I'm in a class and this drama teacher is like, you know, my friends are like, man, you should, dude, you should really consider being an actor. And I was like, oh, you know, I've always wanted to do that. But and he's like, you know, but the one thing you might want to consider is you're just going to get cast as a, probably like a terrorist or a convenience <laughs> store owner. 
He's like, just if you're if you're okay with that, like you're going to get cast as terrorist or convenience store owner or maybe a Mexican, you know. Yeah. And I was like, that sucks. And I was like, I was going. So it was deal killer for me. I'm like, well, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Like my brain's like, what do you mean? I can't control my own destiny or anything like that. Right. And so right. it just was a kind of a non-starter. Um, but I remember, like, that's how it was then. And like now, what's interesting mm-hmm. is, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm watching T. I'm watching a lot of these movies and. And I'm seeing like East Asian representation. You saw what the you know who who won the Oscar this year was you know it's an yeah. Asian based cast, and and I'm seeing a lot of more of like these like leading roles with African Americans, and I'm yeah. seeing these leading roles with people who are Middle Eastern. Dude, you never saw that shit before. It was no. very rare. What what do you think? Like, what do you think that this is just like? Look, like at the end of the day, like what whatever, forty two percent of the population in America might be white, but like the rest yeah. aren't. Right. Yeah. So it's like like forty two percent of the movies should have like white leading actors, and the other like fifty eight percent probably shouldn't. You know, (laughs) like if you were to give a fair representation of the population, like what do you what are your thoughts on this? Being like having someone, you know, especially with the book, and I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but this whole idea of being an outsider and then coming in, like, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think it's smart economics, right? I'll keep it real about money and not make it race and politics. But I think if, you, if you're going to run a business, um, the more open your business is and people see themselves in your product, the more you're going to get a wider piece of the pie. I mean, can you imagine if basketball, football, and baseball still didn't allow minorities to play? Do you think those businesses would be as big as they are now? No. No, they, they'd be boring and they would be very small businesses. And even when you saw one of the last holdouts, golf, um, when Tiger kind of broke the color barrier, and, and that's not that long ago, our, our tennis, um, when those color barriers were broken and those were kind of the last to fall, you saw those businesses exponentially grow. You saw Nike sponsoring uh you know, making its own product line around a golf person. That didn't happen with Nike. It was you were a brand like Nike didn't want to be associated with golf, right? Um, and so I think that it's good business. I think you, you, the more diverse your uh, product line is, the more opportunities you have to get people in. I, I look at Bollywood movies and like I love going see other cultures just like people might say i love hip-hop and i love going see black movies right um but being able to see other cultures it just widens your stance and understanding of what's happening in the world and it makes your world a bigger place so i think it's smart i love it one thing i'll add is i we had a motto if everyone can see a movie everyone should be have the right to make one yeah so that's that's what we say at Urban World. I love that. I have a question for you, um, yeah. and I want I want to move because we're because they're dude, the best part of this. The best is yet to come. I want I want to go to the to the because your entrepreneurial story is like kind of nuts. Um, have you got, have you ever made a movie like you like produced a movie or about, no. like have you you haven't, you haven't done that yet? That's no, all my people bucket. ask me, and I they, I haven't had the itch yet because I've never found a story I think I could tell that people just do a better job. I'm like the guy who wants to help make sure it gets seen um, more than the guy who, I I think I'm very a creative person, but my creativity is in product more than it is in, you know, the consumer side or or the the storytelling side. Oh, I bet just as far as like even just put money in a deal and, and being a producer of it even. I, you know, there's two titles that, Supposedly, I got producers' credits, but I I didn't put money in. I didn't do a thing, and I wouldn't call myself a producer on those things. No, no worries. It's it's, yeah. it's it is a bucket list item of mine. I'm like, I want to make a movie. Um, I just haven't. I it, it's I'll make I'll make it happen at some point. Um, you will. So, so yeah, it's it's just one of those things where I'm like, all right, that's on the list. Um, but but it, but I do mean it. Like I think it would be kind of a cool thing to do. Um, so. So fast forward. So look, you're 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 in the back end of the business, doing the marketing, you know, working in and you know a pretty vicious industry, but you've made it more or less. You have you've been in it. You've worked at multiple big studios at this point. Um, how did that segue into entrepreneurism? I mean, obviously the urban world thing is that a for profit or non profit? Not that that was a non profit. That was kind of 
being an executive that high up in the ranks, feeling like, let me give back. It wasn't thought out originally. I, I If you said it would be going on all these years later, I would have never said, yeah, that's what I think. Um, I just was like, I, I had a resentment that there were just too many people not getting an opportunity to play. And I thought, oh, somebody else will take it over and go do it. But it's years later and it's still going. And uh, somebody said that Urban World is to film what the Apollo was to music. And cool. I thought that was a really wild comparison where we could not play in the film game because it was so expensive. But as the cost came down and access and the audience grew, um, you know, filmmakers of color started to play more and more. But I just never, that's such a wild comparison because when I think of the Apollo and breaking musical acts and stuff that change history. Um, that's a wild thing that someone would make that as a, an analogy. That's so cool. And, and, and you've seen it, man, there's been such this transition, especially over maybe like the last, I don't know, it feels like the last 10 years, maybe even less where guys like Ryan Coogler just, you yeah. know, come out of nowhere and just crush or, I, yeah. um, uh, what's his face appeal, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Peel, man. Oh dude, yeah. I love that guy. Right. Yeah. And, and those guys, like I didn't, I didn't realize he was that talented. I mean, he's funny as fuck, yeah. but I didn't realize yeah. he was that talented on the directing and writing side, right? And I mean, yeah. maybe on the writing side, but but yeah, it's yeah. it's it's, it, and I'm assuming it's platforms like Urban World that that really have kind of, to your point, opened up more access that have led yeah. to where we're at right now, where, dude, everyone's got a pretty nice camera, video camera in their pocket, so you right. know, they, the, the, now and the ability to create content has never been easier, which then makes the ability to create these like bigger films even easier, right? Exactly. Very different than twenty even twenty years ago. So so how did this lead to becoming an entrepreneur? Cause like most people are like, all right, I'm going to keep working my way up through the executive ranks. I'm going to lead a studio. I'm going to be the head of marketing, whatever, you know, like I'm going to be the CMO. Like, but how yeah. does that, how, how do you pull the transition from that? Say like, now nah, F this, I'm going to go, I'm going to go start a business. It was, it was very easy. I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> like all good entrepreneurial stories. You got, you got forced into the deep end. Nice. <laughs> So I, I had Urban World up and running and it was just this nonprofit, you know, charity that I'm trying to give back and um, be a good, good executive. And I was at Focus Features. It, it was called October at that time, but Focus, what today is Focus Features. And I was head of marketing and publicity. And they're like, we're not going to renew your contract. And I was on the East Coast and I had been to Miramax and on the East Coast, it was really too players in town, but I wasn't ready to move back to LA. And I was like, man. And so then I had this thing and I said, okay, let me see what I can do with it instead of going back. And I just was like, you know what? That's it. I'm not working for people anymore. Mm. And it was more like, you know, I had never, I'd never been fired before. And that feeling, we talked about this before you and I started recording that feeling of not being able to control your destiny just did not sit right with me. I was like, I had grossed billions of dollars for people. And I was like, you're out like that. And somebody's having a bad day and, and doesn't like you. Yeah. You and so that was it. I was like, Nope, that's not happening again. And so and um, I never went back. What year was that? 97, 98. Oh wow! Okay, so this is right after right after you got back to to, to New York, and and yeah. how do you mind saying how old you were then? Do you want to date yourself? I mean, I'm good. Yeah, I was twenty. I was twenty six, I think. I was twenty six. Wow. Okay, so so man, so you were yeah. pretty young, pretty young. And how long had you been in the game at this point from on the entertainment? How many like could, would you start I, in your I early twenties? I was supposed 20s? to go to college. Yeah, I was supposed to go to college, and and I had three hundred dollars. And I told my parents I was going to LA on $300 and they were like, what are you talking about? And I was supposed to go to Grambling, um, Grambling State University where both of my parents went and I had $300. I got in my car, I drove to LA and I never came back. I luckily wow. and you're 18. made it, but you're 18. yeah, I you're just graduated from, yeah, I just graduated from high school and all I had saved up was 300 bucks and I drove to LA. See, I'd make Slept the argument on my that, uncle's couch for a bit. 
Yeah, I, I'd make the argument that that's a full blown badass entrepreneurial move, right? Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Like, dude, yeah. Yeah, like it really is. Like, because yeah. and, and a lot of kids were like, there, there was no Gary Vaynerchuk out there like telling no. you not to go to college back then. Like no. nowadays, no. college was cheap back then too, right? Yeah. So and like college was the college, especially being a black kid whose parents were first generation that could go to college, right? Oof. So there was a responsibility to go to college bigger than, oh, you can just go. It was, oh, no, 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 no. We weren't allowed to go in this country. You're going to college. You know, right. it was like that in the house. And my father was a principal, a school oh, principal. Shoot. <laughs> All right. So, so, so you came from like uh, authoritarian yeah. parents, like totally yeah. strict, educated. And to yeah. your point, like this is what late eighties, early nineties, like, yeah. yeah, listen, man, like, like s segregation and people not being able to go to college was like a few decades before that. It wasn't that yeah. long before, right. To your point. Yeah. So, so that yeah. I, I would totally, I would, so were they just devastated or they're just like, the hell are you doing? I, I, I think they didn't think I was serious. And I think they figured I probably wouldn't make it past Albuquerque and I'd probably have to turn back. <laughs> um, cause I, yeah. cause they were kind of like, all right, sure. Okay. And I figured they're, they're thinking, all right, he's going to have a summer off and he's going to go and he's going to find out the hard knocks of life and he'll be back and he'll, he'll, so let him go, let him go get his, get his, you know, his little madness out. But he'll be back. And, uh, uh, they didn't know what they were, who they were dealing with. <laughs> well, they <laughs> raised me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, well, you know, but it's one thing to like raise someone. It's another thing to watch them be industrious like that because you had never been in. They, they never airdropped you into the wilderness until you come home, no. right? Yeah, three hundred, three hundred yeah. bucks, and it was like, oh, that was a long time ago. No, three hundred bucks wasn't shit. Okay, no. like three hundred bucks was like maybe you could survive for a couple of weeks if you were like sleeping on people's couches, right? Yeah. Um. So, yeah. so you, so you got after it. So fast forward, it's, you know, now you're 26, 27, you're in New York. You're like, I'm never letting this happen to me again. You're still really young, but you have a fair amount of life under your belt at that point. You know, that's that most people at 20, nowadays at 26, people are barely like out of their parents' basements. It's a totally different oh, world yeah. now, you know? Yeah. But so you, so you have that in you, that bug, that itch to like be self-sufficient, dependent, yeah. independent. And, and so how did that lead to, you know, Tell us a bit about the stars because movie pass didn't happen for almost a decade until a decade after that. Right. Yeah. So, um, kind of some radical things happened. So, uh, the first like web two, I guess you could say it was web two was starting to emerge, but, um, the first thing we did was we built, we took urban world film festival and then we built urban world films and, we built this company where you could go see the movie in theaters, but then when you bought that movie ticket, it made it that you could have a digital copy of the film online and you could hmm. see it when you want it. And the, the picture was the size of a postage stamp. And it, 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 I don't know if you remember, there was like companies like Akamai and loud cloud and others that, were, were streaming and streaming wasn't a thing yet. And, but, and then, so we, we took that and part of our online thing was we started taking all of these hip hop filmmakers cause they had budgets and they were starting to make these little mini movies. And some of them were behind the scenes of their, their uh, tours, but they were making these almost like Beatles like movies. And we started putting them online. So we had a lot of stuff from Rockefeller with Jay-Z. And um, so we did a bunch of that stuff. And then we got a film company. So we did a joint venture with, with Sony Pictures. And so we had Urban World Films. We put four or five films in theaters. And then so we just kept coming up. And then September 11th happened. And mm. that was it. It was like you couldn't raise – if you weren't a cash flow positive company – you couldn't raise money. There were all the, if you remember, there was a the constant terrorist threats. There was the, uh, everything from running over people to bombs being placed. So it was, it was constantly affecting the movie business and the, um, no one wanted to invest in it. And so I shut down the for-profit side of urban world and that was 2004. And then right about 2005, 2006, Netflix, Hulu, Spotify, Pandora, all of those things were starting to appear on the horizon. And it was like, 
well, why isn't there one of those for, you know, going to the movies? And that was literally the genesis of the thought that then ultimately became movie pass. So, so back then, uh, so you, I mean, man, that's so 04 is all you said. Yeah. So yeah. So after September 11th, we crawled on our belly for about four years and then, uh, 05, 06 was when I started working on movie pass. Wow. And that, I mean, that's, that's crazy. So 05, 06, you're like, I'm going to start a subscription model. And so actually let's take a step to the side here. And for people that don't know what movie pass is, which I do. Yeah. Yeah. The, t- tell them what movie pass is. So let's, let's describe so, this idea. So, so you saw Netflix and Hulu yeah. and I, and I guess I was, I guess I wasn't really uh, Netflix. I back then you could, so I'm going to date myself now. It was in the mail. It was, yeah, a, yeah. You would, it was mail order basically. Yeah. Kids. So mail, what, what's, what's mail? Not, not email, by the way, they would send you, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you something right now. Children that are listening back in the day when your dad was about 20 something, they would send you a DVD in the mail and you could watch it for as long as you wanted to. And then you send it back and then they'd send you another one. You couldn't just go and download some shit and 10 minutes later watch it. You had to wait like two days. Now you're like, that sucks. No, no, no. We were pumped because we didn't have to go drive to Blockbuster to pick movies up and then bring them home and then bring them back. And pay late fees. And pay and late fees. Exactly. They'd, pay, they'd, they'd fuck you with late fees. And, and, and Netflix was like, hey, no late fees. So everyone was like stoked yeah. for it. But anyway, yeah. so, so you're like, oh, they have a model. It's a subscription model. And you paid like 12 bucks a month or 10 bucks a month for, for Netflix yeah. back then. Uh, yeah. which now is all online, but you were like, all right, I want to do a model for what? For people that love movies. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the idea was, okay. I was reading Sam Walton's book, uh, the guy who found at Walmart and his great biography, if, if you haven't read it. And he just starts, he talks constantly about the economy of scale, right? If you can get enough of something like toothbrushes or anything and, and get that cost down and pass on to savings. And all I kept thinking about was, 30% of seats are occupied in the life cycle of a theater, right? So most of the time the seats are empty. Can you imagine a plane that's 30% full and and you run that as a business? None of your, you know, and so it was like, there's so much excess capacity. Mm. What if we can help aggregate that and drive traffic and get, get it at a wholesale price? That was the idea. And then you create a subscription and you pass that savings along to people who are willing to commit to charging you every month. And um, that was the beginning. And so we went around and we talked to all of the studios and all of the theaters and everyone's like, nobody's going to do subscription to movies. We're the movie industry. We don't ever have to change. And um, and that was that was how it began. And we just rang all the doorbells and people, you know, they were like, no get out of here. <laughs> this is the dumbest did, idea we've ever heard. Did you, did you have connections at like the AMCs of the world or did oh. you have to go to the movie distributors? How, so who, who controlled that inventory AMC and, and Regal and all those guys, like who was it yeah, that you had I, to get I, in front I, of? I, I sat with the CEOs of all the majors. So I sat with, uh, Jerry Lopez was CEO of AMC. Amy miles was CEO of Regal. Um, um, uh, before Mark Zlitsky was uh, Dick something. And um, so I, we at Cinemark, so we sat in Cinemark, front of all sure. of them and said, said, you know, look, we're, we see this thing on the horizon. That's generational shift where people want unlimited access, but they're willing to pay a monthly fee. And what's beautiful is you don't have to reacquire the customer every month, right? You don't have to say, come back again, come back again, come back again. And all of them were like, nope, it's IMAX, it's recliners, it's bars. We're going to put in, you know, hamburgers, bars, restaurants. And I said, I get that, but I'm telling you this subscription thing, there's something to it. And everybody kind of laughed me out of the room. Well, it's interesting though, like hindsight being 2020, everyone's like, oh, of course that, that model makes sense, right? If you're at 30, especially if you have 70% of your capacity a- a- available, you're like, well, let me get this straight, man. If you literally give the seat away for free and people buy popcorn, I think there's a fixed cost to the movie either way, right? It's not like they pay, get more yeah. money if they sell a ticket. Is that correct? Or you have to get, like, yeah, how does that so work? They, 
Well, the relationship with the studio, if somebody walks through that door, you know, they do need to give the studio its due, right? They can't just give it away. Um, so there's a, there's what's called an MLA, a master licensing agreement between the studio. So they have to, they have to give them that, but, um, the, there's certain aspects of the business that are, are, you know, outdated. So for example, a $200 million movie and a $2 million movie cost the same to see. Um, the, um, so they don't have flexibility to charge different prices. They don't have fle real flexibility to charge different prices even during the week. Um, there's like discount Tuesday, but that's it. Um, so there's no dynamic pricing. There's no, this movie is a $200 million. This is a 2 million. This is a 30 million. This is a 70 million. Um, none of that capability is in place, but now apps and uh, smartphones make all of that possible. So you can do dynamic pricing, you can do subscription, you can do um, things to fill, like what we saw in travel, the travel industry, when you think about Uber and you think about um, uh, Airbnb, wow, I can, I can take my car. Are, are you familiar with Turo? Where you yeah, can yeah, rent oh, your... Yeah, yeah. yeah, so like all of that, you couldn't do before you had an app. How do you run the card? Who's renting my stuff? Who's staying in my house, right? But but the app universe made all of that possible. And we were like, look, let's take this technology and use it to advance the movie industry. And given so many big stakeholders who have a, a stranglehold on it, it's very hard to deploy new innovation. Um, and so that's, those were the challenges trying to, trying to get movie pass up and on its feet. So you guys raised your seed round in 2011. How much did you guys raise? Uh, we raised a million dollars in two at the end of 2011. And we put up the first product in 20 summer of 2012 on that first million dollars. So you guys launched it. It took three. And, and, and so I'm assuming that it started making money because you guys didn't raise another round for, for almost what? Three years, over three years. No, it... we we kept. No, we kind of kept raising. So we did, we did that first round, and then tragically, the uh, we did it through a ticketing platform. It's still around called Movie Tickets, but now Fandango owns it. Um, and we were born on a Thursday. We had thirty thousand people in a day try and sign up for the service at fifty dollars a month. Uh, in San Francisco alone, and the system crashed. And then Friday, AMC, who was the largest shareholder of movie tickets at the time, shut us down. They they had movie tickets turn us off, and that whole million dollars was wasted because we built the product to out, to be outfitted to their API. So Whoa. we had to we had to bulldoze that. We had about ninety days worth of capital left. So we built a whole new product that was an OTT that if anybody doesn't know what that means, it's an over the top, you know, system. Um, and so what an OTT is, it's completely above and outside of the normal industry infrastructure. And so you could go to all theaters and see all movies where the old version, we had to go through a player and get mm. plugged up into it. And then we were off to the races. And so I'd say all the way up to exit, we raised a total of 10. Uh, wow. So we raised 10 million up to our exit. And at exit, we were valued at around half a billion dollars. So, so you guys did, so you, you, you did, it sounds like about three rounds of, of funding. Is that's at least what Crunchbase it was, says? It was from, it was from a pre-seed, seed, A, A extension. We never did a B. So it was like, and it was, you're just constantly raising money all the time, you know? Got it. And, and, and so how many co-founders were there? Was it you and any other co-founders or just, uh, just me you? and Hame, Hame Watt. Okay. And so, yeah, so you guys, just the two so, of us. so when you sold at the half a billion valuation, did you guys cash out? I mean, obviously like there's a bunch of investors and stuff, but did you guys sell at that price or did you do like a stock swap or like, how did that No. Go? So, so what we did was it was valued less in the deal, but the buying company that acquired us was at $2 a share. Once, once they announced that we were being acquired, uh, it went up to $38 a share. And we, in the deal, there's stock that we were gonna get. 
um, and there's other moving parts. But the, the moral of the story is there was a lockup period for our founder stock. Right. You know, 12, well, six, months. Oh, 12 months. Yeah, 12 we had month 12 months lockup. We had a 12 month lockup and they raised a quarter of a billion dollars and went out of business before we could unload our stock. So we got nothing. No. You didn't, you didn't get any cash up front? Nada. No. Zero. Oh, man, I'm fucking pissed. <laughs> well, this, this, you, you, you said this was a, a crazy entrepreneurial story, but yeah. Oh, man. I, so I'm, we didn't I'm so get, excited to read your book. Yeah. Right, so, so we didn't sorry, get sorry. to take, yeah, we didn't get to take anything off the table. Um, we, we were putting it in and they wanted us to, you know, have a 12 month period before we started to be able to unload and they had certain levels. We couldn't just sell everything. And, um, yeah, believe me, my wife was not happy after did all you that get, time. Did you get, were you able to sell any of it? Did you take some chips off the table or was it just we like the whole we couldn't. The, the, once, once our window was coming up, they were burning they were just crashing and burning in the public every day and the and the stock price was falling so fast and then it got delisted so who, it was who, like who, who sorry i'm going to talk shit on your acquire who are these losers <laughs> that 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 took a half a billion dollar valuation and fucking torched it were they the guys that did fire island or something like that what the yeah no who, was, who does was, that yeah it was a private equity group uh, called hmmy who who had bought it and you know, I said, look, the $10 price point is not sustainable. That is not, when the average ticket in North America is 1150, you can't say you can go 30 times, but give me less than 130th and think you're going to make a successful business. And it was like, it, it just, I, I said to them, guys, that's not going to work. And they were well, like, on, let, let's take don't... a step back. Cause I, I know that I, I read, I read did research on you before you came on the show. So I know what you're talking about, but how much were you guys charging? For, uh, what, were, what were the different packages that people could do when you went right before you sold, when you were in control of pricing for movie pass? Yeah. So when I was CEO on average, people would go two and a half times. Some people go more, some people go less. And our average plan was around thirty dollars. So All right. fifteen bucks. You can fifteen, ten to fifteen bucks a ticket, but per per yeah. watch, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you would pay for that, and you could go to the movies every day if you wanted. Um, but it was like we a gym. Slightly... It, it, it was like a gym, though, right? Where like yeah, everyone pays the right. gym pass, and ninety five percent of people never go, but they don't. They keep the subscription. By the way, this is how everyone makes money on the subscription models. So you were priced yeah. appropriately, right? Yeah. So when the when the owners came in, uh, new owners, they were like, "Netflix is nine ninety nine, and if we want to grow really fast, we should put our price at nine ninety nine." And I'm like, "Yeah, but that doesn't make sense if you don't have a real business underneath, and uh, you're buying your cogs are what they are, and until you change the cog price, you're going to have a problem." And and I think that they thought they could outrun gravity, and um, probably strong arm the theaters and say, okay, well now we're this really big gorilla. Give me the price that I want. Uh, but they ran out of time and ran out of money and it didn't work out the way they thought it was going to work out. So, so they, and, and, and I mean, I remember I was reading the story that these guys were legitimately like doing like unlimited for 30 bucks and, and like all this crazy stuff. 10, right? No, $10, $10 oh, un unlimited, unlimited for 10 bucks. Yeah, it was unlimited for 10 bucks and then they started running in the problems and then they started engaging in questionable activities that the um, the federal courts found to be illegal and they have been indicted and they are going to trial over that. Are they are they have they gone to jail yet or no? No, no, the trials haven't happened. They pled not guilty, but they both they were indicted on uh, certain charges. So, oh, I hope they burn. Um, so, <laughs> man, man, it just sucks. Like they like like look, obviously, like shit happens. This is like yeah. that's why I always tell people in business. I'm like, hey, listen, shit happens. You know, you have all your yeah. eggs in one basket. Anything can happen, and obviously, you 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 took the brunt of that. But Tell me, tell me a happy ending here. So you're buying the thing back now. Let's let's hear about that side of the yeah, story. Yeah. So it's crazy story. So I started another company, got that thing up up and running, and 
while we were out there, um, Mark Wahlberg's people reached out and said, hey, we, we want to make a documentary about this whole thing uh, with HBO and all of this stuff. And the, um, so I was like, sure. So I, I optioned the rights and said, go ahead, make a doc. And so while they were in the middle of production, one of the producers said, hey, um, did you, we, you know, we, we wanted to ask you a question. Did you know that movie pass is up for sale? And I said, it is. And they're like, yeah, it's, it's available. And it's, you know, it's going up for auction. It went up for auction. No one bid it on it. And so I called the uh, bankruptcy courts uh, and I put in a bid and it's kind of, it's public notice at this point, but um, I ended up getting the whole company back for $140,000. Damn. All yeah. right. So That's what, now so, we're talking. Now we're talking. Yeah. So bought the, bought the whole company back at the, uh, end of last year. And, um, I mean, at the beginning of last year and in February announced we were going to bring it back and kind of did a listening tour with customers and theaters and studios. And given we were all emerging out of COVID, everyone was like, hell yeah, bring, bring it back, but bring it back in a healthy, sustainable way. So we changed the system where there's tiers, but kind of like class pass and a few, and, and, airline miles, you're going to get a set of points, but now we've aligned it where when those theaters are empty, it's going to cost you fewer points to go to the movies. But if you want to go Friday night, opening weekend at eight o'clock show, it's going to cost you the most. It's like peak and off peak pricing. Yeah. And now that with that, that system is working, is working better and working right. So now, now we're, now we're back in business. We are in beta. Uh, we uh, opened it up for a wait list and we got roughly just over four days. We got 800,000 people sign up on the wait list. We are loaded in a good chunk of those people. And in May, we're going to open it up to the rest of the country. Are you, did you raise, uh, uh, did you raise any money for this or are you bootstrapping this? We did. Um, we did. We raised, we raised a little cause the economy was crazy. Um, we raised what a minimum of what we needed. We got, uh, Animoca brands, which is the number one web three. I don't know if you know the Animoca guys, but, mm -mm. um, they are probably the leading web three investor, Harlem capital, uh, it also came in on the round with them. Um, there's a group called Front Row and a few others. And pretty shortly here, now that you know all the all the arrows are going up and to the right, um, we're going to open up. Uh, we're looking to open up a public round and do another round shortly here. Now that we got all of our kinks worked out, so man, I'm so pumped for you. You got, you got, you got some, you got some redemption here. You need, you need, you need to make, dude, dude you're going to kill this. I'm really uh, serious. Well, you did listen, you killed it before you just sold it to the wrong idiot. Right. So yeah, which yeah. shit happens, right? Like, look, you, you don't yeah. want to hear about all my wrong moves in business. Um, Jesus Christ. Um, there's, that's a laundry list. Um, but, and you know, it says 2020, you know, like this is now's your time, man. And, and obviously, you know, this business, you know, uh, you know, this company and you know, this business. So mm -hmm. I'm pumped for you, dude. That's really, really cool. Congratulations for that. Thank you, man. Thank you. Most people don't know this. So I come from the mortgage lending business. My listeners know that, but you you probably don't know this. And um, there's a company um, that uh, used to be called Rock Mortgage, Rock, R-O-C-K. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. they sold to this company called Quicken by Intuit yeah. that's owned by Intuit and became Quicken Mortgage. And then yeah. it got bought back after the, after the 2000 blow up by the Rock Mortgage. And it Quicken Mortgage became Rocket Mortgage now, and it's the largest mortgage wow. lender in the United States. Most people don't know that he bought that company back from Quicken. He had to wow. license the name from them for because they ran into the fucking ground. Yeah. And and he and dude, he was not a billionaire, by the way, when he bought it back. He was he yeah. had done well. And that yeah. guy now is a billionaire like ten times over. Wow. Maybe I, I may I may be way off on that. He might be a billionaire fifty yeah. times over. I know he owns the Cleveland Cavaliers. But, Jesus. but he so this is that that's a serious you reminded me of that story like your story is the that's same story crazy. so i expect you to which team you're gonna buy nets <laughs> the, the brooklyn I'll, I'll call i'll i'll call you to consult first <laughs> yeah 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 but, so it's funny is his biggest competitor is another guy who like literally ripped off the guy that the quick, quicken guy his biggest competitor is like across the street in detroit 
he uh, he just bought the Phoenix Suns. So, oh my goodness! I, I mean, I don't know if you like basketball or not, but I, I don't give a shit about sports. But yeah. but I do think yeah, you should yeah. buy a team once once okay. once the movie pass <laughs> crushes. Um, so man, let's 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 wrap up here. I, we have, I mean, we talked about your story. So is this? Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about the book. I want to I want to hear about that, um, and then I'll, I'll get you out of here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So originally the book really started as a mixture between so so I got fired, right? So uh, I told the board, look. This ten dollar price point's not going to work, and you guys are going down a path that I think is ill fated. And they were like, "Look, you don't agree with our mission. We bought you. You didn't buy us. You're off the board, and you're out of the company." They emailed me and sent me an email and fired me via email. And oh, that's that's cute. So, yeah. So, um, and the email said, "We wish we were there to do this in person." That was the first <laughs> part of the <laughs> oh, and, um, classic. Yeah, we wish we were there to do this in person, but well, we could we know, couldn't make it. Our salami sandwich is at the is at the deli. We got to go pick it up. <laughs> uh, un- unfortunately, we feel that your services are no longer needed. Oh, blah shit. blah blah. Please evacuate your office. Anyway, so l- needless to say, I had a pretty big resentment, and I had some friends talk me off the ledge from taking some critical emails to the New York times. And they said, don't do that. That's stupid. Sit tight. And then somebody, I don't remember who said it. Somebody said, you know, a good way to get this out is write a book. And I was like, huh. And literally I sat around for maybe two years, year and a half, two years, didn't write. And then it hit me like it, it kind of all came together. And I said, Maybe I can leave some breadcrumbs for other founders so that this doesn't happen to them, right? That was my first thought because I didn't, I felt like I was, I was a loser and who's going to want to read about losing, right? But then it was, wait, but I've got a lot of wisdom and maybe I can help some people sidestep these traps. And then I started writing and, and once I kind of knew my mission, like, okay, I'm going to help other founders. Um, then it gave me a sense of purpose and I just committed to a page a day. Next thing I knew I had 200 pages done in like 90 days. And, um, and then right around that time when the whole Mark Wahlberg thing kind of came together and a publisher picked it up and the idea was the publisher said, you know, we think that there's a power to your story because you were an outsider and so many people really identify with with that story. And that's, that's really how the title came to be. Um, Cause we didn't have a working title. I wasn't sure what it was other than some bad titles that I won't say here on public I radio mean, come channels. On. Come on, man. <laughs> Dude, I, you, I'm, I'm like a no filter guy. Just give me, throw me a bone. Throw me a fucking bone. Just give me at least one. Give me, give no, me. It was, it was, it, you know, titled like, fuck you. You'll never do that to me again. Kind of stuff. It's oh, like, oh, okay. Oh, you know, it, it was, it was just like, it was just <laughs> anger. I remember the editor saying, you need to take this whole chapter out. She was like, don't say that. Like, she was just like, this is seething anger. Like, just yeah. don't, it's not constructive. Yeah. Um, killing, so, they, call it, so, they call it killing your baby in the editing process. You, they're like, this yeah. is just for and, you, Stacy. You're just self, you're just healing right now, man. <laughs> you should have titled it. Listen, if I, if I, I it's too late now. But yes. it, could, you could, you, you could have called it fuck that guy. And it could have been all that. <laughs> Uh, and that would have, I, I cut that, that might have, that might have got some legs on it. I'm just throwing it out there. Might, might have got some legs. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we, we retooled some parts and it was like, okay, if I can help others and if, like, especially, you know, that saying, if you wrote yourself, if your older self wrote a book to your younger self to say, let me tell you what to watch out for, what's coming, that's what I tried to do and say, all right, I'm going to make a whole lot, whether they're, minorities or women or founders who just care. I'm going to take this media business experience and I'm going to pour it into a book. And that's how I learned. I read David Geffen. I read Richard Branson. I read Sam Walton. I read uh, Sumner Redstone. I read uh, Paul Newman. I read Quincy Jones. I read, like I read everybody's biography. And what's beautiful is when you read those books, you get, all these maneuvers they had to do to get where they were. 
in your brain. And uh, I thought, all right, well, I'm going to add my, there were no books by tech founders of color. Yeah. And we checked because they were like, okay, let's look for a comparable. And there's no books. USA Today named me one of the 21 most influential people of color in tech. Thank you for that. But you know, there was no, there were no books by anybody. So if, I, if there's a little brown kid or a little black kid, can they see a cover that says, oh, I can do that too? So um, that was the whole purpose. Like, let me leave those crumbs for them. I love that, man. That's, that's, that's badass. So the book, here we are, Black Founder by my man, Stacy Spikes. Uh, where can people get the book? Let's, 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 let's uh, let Amazon, the listeners Amazon, Barnes & Noble, local bookstore came out about uh, six weeks ago. And uh, it's doing great, and we're really happy. I'm excited. I, I love the messages that I've been getting from people, especially from founders or from entrepreneurs that have been like, wow, this really helped me. So that if you do read it, please DM me, let me know. I, I just love hearing the feedback of people saying how much that's helped them, and that's, that's the whole purpose of the book. If, if it helps one person, that's all I'm here to do. Oh, I love it, man. Stacy Spikes, man, what a fun show. I mean, dude, you didn't. You, if you saw me twenty minutes before the show, I was like, oh, I'm tired. I don't know if I want to do a show. And I, and then I was like, ah, oh, but I got to do my show. And dude, you got me so fired up. Seriously, I, I love this show a lot. I appreciate all the greatness you bring into the to the planet. Uh, the book sounds amazing. I'm pumped to read it. I apologize for not reading before, but I'm going to be reading your book and Movie Pass, dude. You're gonna. This is this is it. This is the you're gonna crush it. I can't wait for this thing to like take over like it like it's going to. This is gonna be badass. So, Thank you, man. Work, man. Thank you so much. This was fun. This was a lot of fun. Um, so why don't you uh, there, besides the book, anything else you want to plug? Where can people connect with you? Where can they learn more about Movie Pass? Where, where can they sign up? Let's let's do all the plugging and then we'll get you wrapped up here. Yeah. So Movie Pass is easy. MoviePass.com. Um, you can see my stuff and just stuff on me at Stacy spikes.com you can find me there i'm on twitter and instagram and all the other this and that's the usuals um but yeah i'm 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 easy to get to so not that complicated nice i'm gonna throw something at you and i and i i I've got, sometimes i get really fired up before the show and i forget to tell people i like to do this but we have a yeah. thing called the greatness the greatness question here on the show do you mind if i okay. ask you the greatness question you sure. cool with that Sure. All right. We're going to end, we're going to end on the greatness question. And then we're going to get you out of here. So, okay. The greatness question is what is the number one barrier to creating greatness that you overcome in your life? And how did you overcome it? Uh, I think the greatest barrier for most of us is our minds. Um, I think we limit ourselves more than the world limits us. And I'd say the How did I overcome it? I, I would say I overcame it by learning to turn off that voice that says, man, you can't do this. Are you kidding me? It's almost like I just sit there and go, okay, thank you for sharing. That's nice. But we're going to go anyway. Because I think after September 11th, I was like, I'd rather die. There's a great saying, it's better to die, die on your feet than to live on your knees. And, you know, for me, dying on my feet meant trying and building great things. Living on my knees is doing a job, watching my life go by, knowing I didn't have the courage to go try. So I'd rather die on my feet and fail than live on my knees and I was too afraid to try. I would say that that idea changed everything for me. There's the quote, baby. Rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Stacy Spikes. You're a gentleman. You're a badass. Can't wait to see all the greatness that you are going to continue to create in the world. And it's my pleasure to meet you and hang out with you today, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Darius, ping me when you're coming to New York, buddy. I will, man. I might, I might ping. I'm going tomorrow, so I'm going to ping you. I'm going to ping you, and maybe we'll come in. We'll have a little coffee I'm here. my son and you and uh, whomever. Let's go to all right, a movie. my friend. Uh, thank you. <laughs> all right, I'm going to take you up on that. Oh, uh, man. Thank you. Thanks so much, my friend. I appreciate you. Um, listeners, share this. We're leaders or givers. We're sharers. Share this with anyone that needs to hear it, which is everybody. Go get the book. Go sign up for Movie Pass. Until next time, peace out, everybody. We love you. Uh, she's my lover. I think
You are listening to The Greatness Machine, and that's a wrap for today. Listen, if you love what you heard, subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform that you're tuning in on so that you don't miss any of our future episodes. We have tons of great people coming on, and we're, we're stoked to have you here to enjoy it with us. Leave us a review. Tell us what you love most about this particular episode. We love getting the reviews. We love to see what you guys love most. And if this particular episode, you know, made you think of someone who's leveling up in their business and in their life, print screen, share it with them. Leaders are the best givers. And after all, we're all here to support and grow with each other. And in case you want to see some of the fun behind the scenes shots or some of the things that we're doing, I'm actually writing about this in my weekly newsletter. Go to www.therealdarius.com and subscribe to my newsletter. We're talking about fun things like business and life and mindfulness and cryptocurrencies and gosh, I don't even know everything and anything, but it's tons of fun stuff I write about. I try to get it out on a weekly basis. You can subscribe at www.therealdarius.com. And with that said, look, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. I love you. Peace. We're out of here. See you guys on the next one. Oh,